Hello and welcome to everyone. This is the first early career group lecture of the year. Uh, as I'll mention in a moment, we've got a few more coming up, but uh, many thanks to James Heslington, who is currently joining us from Canada for this, uh, this what should prove to be a very interesting lecture on all the work done up in uh, North, or North Yorkshire, or from a Newcastle perspective, down in North Yorkshire, I suppose. Just a few quick notices, our next Institute lecture in person is going to be on the Thursday, the 15th of December. Uh, that's jointly with the Institute of Corrosion. And that's looking at anti-fire protection coatings. Uh, it will be followed by an Institute Christmas social afterwards uh, with a lovely curry buffet of some variety. Uh, so do please remember to sign up for that and come along on the night as well. Uh, hopefully a train strike won't get in the way. Uh, further, Quick note, this is part of our, uh, this lecture here is part of our early career series. Uh, in the spring, we're hoping to have a session on chartership. Uh, so that's your sort of chartered engineers with uh, IMMM, as well as a couple of other professional institutes who offer chartership and the importance of that in moving ahead in your career. Uh, and towards after Easter in the summer, we're going to have the excellent Alice Slattery, uh, who's also a member of our institute talking about water conservation and management engineering uh, and don't forget we've got our IMMM young persons lecture competition coming up on the 23rd of February uh, this is open to people under the age of 28 and under uh, so if you can sign up for that any aspiring people there is a prize uh, of 100 pounds for the winner of the local heat and then they can go on to the national competition if you know any young engineers uh, across a range of it doesn't have to just be mining um, uh, do do please chivvy them towards this because uh, it's an excellent opportunity. I, I believe uh, uh, it, it, great things happen when you win. Uh, don't forget, there's loads of uh, ways to follow us, uh, keep up with our, our events. We're our online. This lecture will eventually work its way onto our excellent YouTube channel as well uh, to join all of our other uh, videos. Uh, and uh, there's plenty of stuff going on. And if you want to get hear more the best ways of course to become a member via mindinginstitute.org.uk forward slash membership uh, we've got a range of excellent activities you were at one of our talks uh, our annual dinner which brings um, engineers from across the north of england together we've now got bi-monthly socials uh, and of course the occasional field trip so so far we, we've kept it quite local but uh, we'd like to go international sooner rather than later uh, plenty of other benefits of membership as well uh, as well as opportunities to get involved in our work. Uh, we're definitely looking for people to join our committees. So if you're interested in uh, taking on any, any voluntary roles and uh, getting involved in, in anything, uh, do drop us a line at office at mindinginstitute.org.uk. So uh, now on to the moment you've been waiting for. Um, we're delighted to have James Heslington here. Uh, James is the lead project engineer with DMC Mining Services and holds a BSc and an MSc from Camborne School of Mines. He also won the 2021 Tunnicliffe Medal, which is a medal jointly awarded by our institute and the Midlands Institute of Mining Engineers for his outstanding early career work on the shaft sinking at Woodsmith Mine. Uh, if you want more information about the Tunnicliffe Medal, it's of course on our, on our website. But uh, I believe James will be giving a lovely overview of uh, the work that got him the medal this evening. So uh, over to you, James. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. I'll just get up my screen now. So, uh, yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, in terms of my presentation tonight, uh, like Andrew said, it is a presentation on my award-winning presentation for last year for the John Tunnicliffe Award. Um, so it is a rerun of the presentation I did last year. Um, obviously, and was, was lucky enough to represent the Midlands Institute and then go forward and actually win the medal last year. So quite an honour to win that. And unfortunately, John Tunnicliffe did pass away last year. Um, I know he had a lot of involvement of young engineers in the sector and trying to drive and push for development. So it was certainly an honour for myself to uh, win that award. Just a quick overview of what I'll be covering today. So a bit of a brief background on the project that I was on. Uh, my personal involvement in the service shaft. So at the time I was the project engineer for the service shaft. I did dot between that and the MTS shaft, uh, but primarily for this presentation, I'll cover on my works on the service shaft. Moving on from that, I'll go into the packages to the scopes of work. So I cover mat handling, ventilation, the shaft works, and also some shaft protection. 
for each of those packages, I'll go through the considerations. So the key roles for project engineer, looking into the quality, the environmental, obviously safety as well. And then finally, a discussion point. Obviously, at the end of this, if there are any further questions, we'll have a, a short question and answer session afterwards. So just as a, a brief forward before we get started. Uh, so I have actually left the Woodsmith project. I've been in Canada with DMC Mining Services for the past 10 months. So this was written at a time when I was on the Woodsmith project. A lot has changed on the project since then. Um, and obviously, I am certainly with certain questions, will not be able to answer them. It's only based upon my involvement I had at Woodsmith and my involvement in the in the project itself, not, not really any uh, critical information. So a bit of an overview for the Woodsmith project. I'm sure most of you have heard of it being a, a world leading project and especially located in, in the UK. So it's owned by Anglo-American Crop Nutrients, uh, mining for a mineral called polyhalite. And that's involving the sinking of two deep shafts, so both down to 1,600 metres. And then there's a third smaller shaft down to 360 metres, a drill and blast one. So between the Whitby, well, where the mine is located, and also Teesside, you've got a large tunnel, one of the largest tunnels in Europe, actually. Uh, and that's for transporting the mineral from the mine itself to the port for transporting or exporting around the world. So in terms of my project involvement as, as the project engineer, so that's involving package management. So control of engineering, budget, schedule, and then the construction activities, a bit of a cradle to grave type arrangement. So that's involvement with mechanical, electrical, instrumentation, structural scopes. And that's also involving subcontractors and self-performance works. So really quite a varied scope uh, for the engineers there. With the third, most of the, the engineering design was done by uh, third party. So we had our design office, do complete the designs, we take that and then we go and build it. A lot of the, the concepts and philosophies, and obviously your user requirement specs, that's all driven from the site team and, and the operations. So what we're really doing there, and certainly for myself, uh, it was a lot of key interface with constructability, QA, and also the development of that. So I think it's really key just to go through the engineering basis uh, and the, the project engineer's role before we go into the packages, just so you can understand what it is that I did and not do as my job day to day. So you're essentially taking something from concept, take it through the design works, you're interfacing with the engineering team, and then developing that scope of work. That scope is essentially your key document for enabling the execution of that package. Take it through the tender process. So again, ISO accredited companies, you'll work to a competitive tender, so that's three plus. Then you take it all the way through onto site. So as that contract's awarded, you go through the procurement process. So that involves fabrication, manufacturing, through to the delivery on site, fabrication then install. You can see a lot of acronyms highlighted here. Um, I know it's everyone's worst nightmare. Uh, and you know, I've obviously highlighted them. So key ones really that, that we'll work to is your FATs, your SATs, so your site acceptance, your factory acceptance, make sure everything is right before you bring it. Inspection test plan is also a key one. So we use that throughout the sector, essentially making sure that the contractor, the supplier has completed everything to how it should be. It's essentially a check sheet. So before it comes to site, you've gone through your check sheet, all your qualities in place, and you can bring it onto site. And obviously you have your turnover process once you've completed installation before you move into commissioning. I mean, the end goal for, for myself on the project was to take something from concept phase and hand it over to operations. And then in theory, my, my job was complete. So in terms of the packages, one of the key interfaces was the pre-construction phases. So I've essentially enabled this phase two. The phase three goes into the construction. So you can see all the key interfaces for, for every package that we had to, had to install. So procurement, this was key, obviously based upon phase delivery. So a lot of my packages, I used to phase them. So I would bring certain items in first and then certain items later. And that was all driven by the schedule. I've already mentioned the importance of quality. So again, certainly for things like uh, C marks, uh, any modifications made, and obviously when it comes to safety critical equipment, again, I had to make sure that was all managed really, really well. Ultimately, if something goes wrong, they go back through the quality packs and you have to make sure that everything is there and obviously checked and, and in place. Environmental, the, the nature of the Woodsmith project being in a national park, is a very, it brings a lot of new challenges that you might not get necessarily in other mines. So, a funny one, certainly once a year we'd have problems with nesting birds. 
So you used to have to make sure everything was of year. Again, with different colours. So you see everything had to be a certain green colour to blend in with the countryside. So presented a few different challenges that you don't usually see throughout the, uh, the mining sector worldwide. And then regulation, as we all know, safety is the number one driver on any project. And a few regulations we had to consider for every package. So not only did we have the, the UK mines regulations, we also had the Anglo-American technical standards. That's something that I had to adopt halfway through uh, the, the process. So that brought, again, a few more challenges, having to align to slightly different specs, which the designs not might have been too, but then we had to adapt to those new standards. And then again, British standards, working in, in, in package engineering in the UK, I got a, a really great knowledge of, of British standards, some obscure ones, um, especially for the mining sector as well. A lot actually fall back on some of the old coal mining standards, which are quite interesting. So the first package I'm going to talk to you today about was the foreshaft steel. Uh, so you can see the foreshaft itself from the pictures earlier. It's 43 metres deep, 35 metres diameter. Really, really large. And that's a lot of steel. There's about 800 tonnes worth of steel that had to be installed in that. And based on the schedule, uh, it was obviously trying to get it in the most efficiently we could. Uh, so in terms of this work, uh, there was a lot of scheduling activity that I had to do with the operations team. Not only was I working with the steel erectors, but also with some of the service installers. So at the same time as we we're trying to install the steel, we're also completing some of the civils work and also looking towards installing the SBR, which I'll touch on a bit later. My main driver for that was bottom up construction. So install everything at the bottom and then obviously work your way up. So everything had to be lifted from surface. So there's a lot of interface playing that had to do with the surface teams and also the, the shaft teams just to make sure that the risk of dropped objects and obviously double working was not, not there. So here's a, a good example of the piece. So this is what we're working with. This is before any of the steel went in. So you can really see the challenges that, that I was faced with when working with the construction team. You can see the shaft there. So at the time uh, that we were trying to plan this, we actually were working with the smaller pre-sink whilst the workers were sinking that and trying to fit out the, the upper shaft. So like I said, in terms of the breakdown for procurement quality and environmental, uh, a lot of the procurement was based on those phased deliveries. So steel was only brought to site when we could install it. In terms of quality, again, there were shop inspections for the steel and the sign off before delivery. And that ties off nicely with procurement. So essentially when I went to the shops to accept the steel, uh, we would get the invoice from that. And there are a few cases where actually I pushed back and wouldn't accept the steel. Uh, we had that with surface protection. Environmental, you know, we mentioned it before and, and very important. All our lighting had to be pointed down. So there were certainly considerations when walking around with the electrical teams to install lighting, everything had to, to point down for that. Next page we're going to talk about is muck handling. So talking about that bottom up phase, all the stitch structural steel for the head frame first, and then moved on to the muck handling. So this was a very exciting package. Uh, again, worked on that from the concept stage and took it all the way through to commissioning and operations. Uh, so with that involvement, I had a lot of involvement with the, the hazards. So essentially your hazard identification sessions. We ran a series of three of those sessions to make sure the operations team were going to use the system correctly and safely. A lot of interface with this. So I had to consider uh, your conveyors, you know, your, your feeder screens, along with all the steel installation. So hydraulics, you know, again, safety critical. I have to consider a lot of things with that. And one thing I, I worked quite closely with that, which is making sure the piping routing was accessible for the maintenance teams and also for the installation. So you can see the far suppression. This was an afterthought, something that we actually didn't think would be needed. And again, something that I worked with senior management at the site and the safety team, determined we needed it, went out, scoped it up and took something that was an idea in a head and eventually installed and fully commissioned. So that fire suppression system all came from the conveyors that we had on site. Essentially did a bit of research into different types of conveyors and the belt regulation. It was deemed that the belt we had actually could be yeah, be improved in terms of fire resistance. So you can see we went from a DIN Y to a DIN S type. 
that's something I work quite closely with the management team with, had involvement with Mines Inspector as well, just to try and really develop a belt that hadn't been produced in the country before. Uh, and then we installed it. So the whole system was installed. So not only did we have to install a belt and work with the vendor to create this new type of belt, but also actually had to work to install it, strip down the conveyor, reinstall the belt, whilst considering all the interface with the further scope. Another interesting one that I worked on with the conveyors was all the guarding. So again, with your prior assessment, um, again, that was an assessment assistance from, from third parties, working through the guarding requirements, making sure that the health and safety was compliant with the best we could do. So essentially you're taking everything to a LARP, it's called. So as low as reasonably practicable for your risk. That muck handling system, uh, you know, the conveyors will have downtime for maintenance and also unforeseen issues. So a backup system for that was our crane system. Not only that, but the large foreshaft that you saw the pictures of with the steel collar area, there's only really one access route for materials and that's via this crane. So this was, a, again, a, another interesting package that I took from concept threes all the way through to operations. So essentially working not just the procurement and the install of that crane, but also the other interfaces. And we'll move on to the protection system later in the presentation. So the crane itself, extremely long lead time. So it was a year lead time and also large, large budget as well. So in terms of that, I had to make sure the steel was up first, whilst considering how we install that crane. Now the crane was quite an interesting one, uh, certainly in terms of installation. You can see that the building was, uh, was erected before the crane. So I actually had to install that in two halves, or three halves in fact, install each of the girders for the crane and then the, the trolley and the bridge itself. So there was a lot of lifting, a lot of interface between myself, the, the lift we had on site and also the crane supplier, just a good splitter like that and install it in, the, in that phase. And that took, uh, in the end, it actually took five days to install the crane itself using multiple, uh, multiple lifts. Another that was the edge protection. So large face, got a to drop for the shaft. So again, in terms of needed edge protection, so again, something that I, I worked closely with third party vendors to design a system I've seen hand barriers, so when the crane was lifting, you could still lift a container through. At the same time, you had your edge protection when needed. Considerations for this, you know, spoken about procurement, there's quite a lot of uh, reactive, but additional items for our change management. And then environmental muck coming to the surface, a lot of materials, it's all about that way management. Another consideration you talk about your pre starts and, and the light beacon. Again, in a national park, you have to be very considerate of loud and bright lights. So everything had to be contained in, inside that collar building. As I said earlier, the regulations, uh, certainly, you know, the UK coal regulations, or the old ones, so CR 13 is a good reference. Certainly to go back to, to see essentially how the standard is in the country based upon the, the large mining sector we did have. And that a lot can be learned to this day based upon those old regulations. Ventilation, you know, one of your mining major hazards, gas presence. So in terms of ventilation, a key interface for any mining environment, is, as most of us are aware. So quite a large system. This was a, an interesting concept. What wanted essentially was something that was quick to install and temporary in nature. So once you're done with it, you can move the fans away put them elsewhere for another project, underground, whatever it might. So as you can see from that, that drawing, the, the event system is all containerized. So very quick to install, very quick to remove and you know change around. In terms of the delivery for the ducting, again, I wanted to phase all of that. So the way I broke down was the installation of all the steel ducting at surface first, and then the transition through to plastic ducting within the foreshaft at a later stage. So in terms of that delivery, uh, there was about a four week lag on that. And that was just so we had time to construct the scaffold in the foreshaft itself, and build up. And that's whilst interfacing with the works below, uh, putting in service piping and the electrical fit out. So another interesting one, there was no transition from hard line to, to steel in, within the design concept. 
to again work with a third party just to create actually it was an epoxy a grp transition piece where it went from the steel down through the hard line so quite a quick easy thing to fabricate uh, again just based off a sketch that i produced in terms of a tech zoning essentially this is your or hazardous uh, zone classification based on gas presence was at a risk of, of methane. So again, another forward uh, thought that we had to implement was the ATEX classification of zones. So one thing I, I worked with once we had installed the ventilation was to work on the ATEX safe proofing of the fans. Um, and that was quite a quick install. Well, I said a lot of reactive thinking and then working with the post install. So my belief was we install to design and then modify after that, just preventing option engineering, as we, we would say. Considerations, you can see that wonderful green color that we spoke about. And then another one in the house in the background, you can see the, the cladding on the buildings. So again, it's all designed to tie into the natural environment, actually like a farm building. Something that that, that project is, is very good for, blending into the environment, you know, not looking what we would class as a normal mine. Ventilation, especially over here, it's quite interesting. Once you get the cold mornings, you get large plumes. So you can't really hide that. Uh, but it's actually a big consideration uh, for the sinking phase over there. That's one thing we started to look into in terms of protection for that plume and enclosures for, for the dust systems. So I think one of the most exciting things about the, the Woodsmith project would be the use of the shaft boring road headers or the SBRs. So the machines themselves are actually numbers three and four ever used. So quite exciting to be used. Uh, had previously been used in Janssen over in Canada. Um, and then obviously Woodsmith was the second phase of that. So I know I mentioned previously was the ATEX modifications. So those modifications were also required on the SBR. And that's something I had to work quite closely with the fitters of the SVR and the shaft to work and make those modifications. And those were quite large, certainly on things like the cutting head on the cutting drum. That's something that was, was long scope and took about two weeks to install. It also ties in with some modifications that had to be made with the ventilation. And again, that's something I worked with our ventilation engineer to make that transition nice and clear. You can see a lot of the, the services that we had to take in. You know, a lot of the water lines, compressed air, watering, uh, and that was all run into the shaft and installed on those shaft side walls. So a lot of scaffolding was required, a lot of interface with your safety of dropped objects. And again, that was something I was working closely with the construction team. So in a perfect world, what would have done bottom up, you know, you install the steel of your head frame, install the services. But due to lead times on pipes, that wasn't possible. So I had to work quite closely with the contractor just to make sure we could install that piping whilst and they worked to go on around it. And that's something we did quite successfully. So again, just another overview, you can see the muck bucket there and, and, and the SBR install itself. Uh, I think one of the most enjoyable packages I had was, was the installation of the SBR itself. So that's something I worked with uh, one of the lifting companies we had essentially to create multi-phase lift and transport. So not only did you have the lifting of the modules of the SBR from the lay down where they were constructed, they were then transported across the site to another crane, we did down into the 43 meter fore shaft and then transported again over the shaft before they're roped up. So you can see the different modules there. And again, this was quite a schedule that had to work quite closely with the contractor and our ops team. So essentially each module would be lifted down. Module seven, which is that top one, actually the lifting frame. And we lower one and built it up on well, within the shaft. My key involvement was that was the surface and the lifting activities. Once the SBR was in the shaft, I essentially was handing over to the operations uh, lead who was then managing the fit out of the SBR at that phase. I didn't go back into the SBR constructability or my interface until we had the ATEX remediations. Another interesting one to talk about is, uh, you know, the backup systems for the slick lines. So certainly something I was working with operations teams about was that contingency, always making sure we weren't reliant on one system, similar to your emergency means of, you know, egress. In the shaft, you need your two means of escape, or it's your backup escape, and it's the same with these systems. My belief is to have not just your primary, but your secondary system. 
especially with things like shaft, shaft sinking, where it's all about efficiency. You don't want any loss. So if your slick line for your concrete goes down, you move on to your concrete and pour that way. So you can see a picture at the, at the top right there. That's your, your, uh, your module seven. So that's essentially what I was using as the lifting frame into the shaft. Once the SBR was installed, we installed the structural steel straight after, again, trying to, to improve that schedule and, and install things as, as quickly as we could. Another interesting one I was working with with our, our SBR operationals team was about how to maximize the efficiency of, of the SBR cuts. So that's certainly something that's quite dynamic and it'll continue throughout the project and throughout the, uh, the sink, but trying to optimize how the machine will cut, the maximum cut, essentially works in a big sweeping fashion, the, uh, the road header itself. So again, lots of in interesting potential for that. In terms of that quality, uh, you know, we mentioned about the ATEX, so an ATEX register is needed for any modifications with that. And that needs to be updated, recorded, and inspected by a, a competent person at multiple stages. Final package you're going to talk about is, is the shark protection. So as we said before, health and safety is, you know, the most safety is certainly the number one uh, within any mining environment, especially when it comes to shark sinking. It's extremely high risk and, and dangerous activity. Not only do you have, you know, potentially extremely deep shafts, but open edges, working un below suspended objects. The list is really quite endless. Um, same when we got there, there was, there was a a lack on the safety systems so that's something i i was certainly quite keen on to drive bring essentially things not only for safety and with protection systems but also automation don't want to put in systems that have to be managed by people because ultimately once there's human involvement there's risk for human error so a lot of these systems were automated all tied into our plc system uh, through our switches and through our instrumentation and that allowed us to actually monitor systems and tell you what was down and, and what wasn't. So what we had was a series of what we call Manchester gates, essentially they're large stoppers to protect against potentially the largest equipment that could be there. So within the foreshaft, we were fitted to what equipment could be, could be driving around. Um, but it was my belief that all of these should be designed to withstand the largest item. So they were. Our surface, slightly different, slightly larger equipment on surface at slightly higher speed. So there were slightly larger gates at surface to withstand that. And actually talking to the third party on that, we actually went down the route of going for a more, more like a park style barrier. And you actually see quite a lot of them around, certainly, you know, in London, Westminster Bridge, for example. That was something I, uh, I enjoyed working with them on. It was very good. In terms of that integration with the switches, I had a key interface with the control philosophy, essentially making sure that the, the process was correct. So I want to make sure that when, when X tripped, it wouldn't allow you to buy. And that's really quite key because you're trying to pull through the operations team. They'll have something go down. They want to know what's tripped and why, what that logic has functioned. Um, so that logic tried to make it as simple as possible. A few variations on that. But ultimately, like I said, that was me driving what was safe whilst balancing what had to be done for the operations team to enable efficient sinking. Uh, safety integrity level switches. So certainly when we're talking about safety critical items where there is a, a major hazard, we had to well, we had to use SIL level two switches. That's the same with our magnetic switches for some of the gates to access the shaft, essentially providing a, a high integrity level. Nice overview there, showing that crane, the, the protection area as well, lifting one on the muck farm. In terms of procurement, uh, a lot of the additional items were driven by some of those lead times. So there was a staggered installation and delivery that I drove for that. In terms of the quality, the ITP is very key on safety critical items. So expect a full dossier for everything. That's something I certainly drove and worked closely with our quality team to make sure everything was documented correctly, any change was documented, and also the, the appropriate level of sign off on it. In the key one for when we're talking about shaft protection systems and you know user interface would be the ergonomics. You got to think about fitness for purpose. Not only is it doing its principal goal of keeping people safe, but it's also got to be there and user friendly. Do people use it? 
will they use it or will they sign, try and sidetrack it? Ultimately, in the mining sector, you know, miners will try and find the easiest route. And if that means walking around a barrier, they will. And again, some key config considerations with that in terms of regulations, not only your mining regulations, but your technical standards were pulled into that. And a favourite one of mine is your British Standard 14973, which is your guarding for, for machinery and equipment. So just as a quick summary of, of my involvement on the project, what I learned, what I got from it. I think the key for, for any project engineer is you have a key understanding of process implementation and building relationships. Now, when you take something from concept and take it to the commissioning phase, you're not only having that understanding, the design interface, but also the operations interface and then through to commissioning. So you get to understand and realise what's quite important for packages uh, when the end user receives them. Working relationships is key because not only are you dealing with the lifting team, the materials handlers, you're also dealing with the contracts team from you know, contracts litigations and procurement. So you really see a, a variety of, of people who have different priorities. You know, some of them from the procurement side are interested in budget and also contractual standpoint legally. But then once you get the items on site, it's all about making sure you're, you're down to earth and you plan something correctly with the lifting team. It's about putting yourself on the level of, of who you're working with essentially. The completions team involved was was great for me. You know, I've got a strong belief in, in handovers and a proper process. And that was certainly seen through the change management process. I, I certainly drive and, and own change management. As a project engineer, you're a gatekeeper. So any change, when you've got your superintendent shouting that they want something done quickly, you're the person there to make sure that it's done correctly. Otherwise, it's your head on the block. What that usually means is you're there mopping up, uh, up behind people. And I think that's quite key for any young engineer to understand and appreciate, you know, right, this is the correct process of doing things and this is how it has to be captured. Uh, one, one key thing, I think, again, any, anyone will know from the sector or from projects certainly, is fitness for purpose. So I was, I'm a big believer in build to design and you change. So obviously, if something isn't fit for purpose, it's unsafe, it's just not going to work from the start, then yes, you certainly build. But otherwise, option engineering, the next person always has a better idea of what they've done before. And it's an endless circle. So always build to design first and then improve once you go through operational requirements. Yeah, instructability, always key, not only managing the construction, but also schedule and budget. I think any project manager, any project engineer will always have an appreciation for getting things on, on time and also getting things on budget. You know, it's, all, it's the one that we always chase, quality budget and schedule. Um, and, and certainly we, we met uh, a lot of those parameters well. I think really that, that wraps up my, my presentation. I completed. Um, obviously, got a bit of time left for any questions at the end. Should anyone have questions? I've also left my contact details if, if anyone wants to reach out. I am uh, the young members representative for the Midlands Institute and certainly a, a strong, firm believer in helping out and giving other young engineers any inspiration that they need. Quite fortunate in my experience, what I've had. And I believe that by inspiring people with projects like this, not only at Woodsmith, but also around the world, such as myself in Canada at the moment. You've got a few interesting ones in, in Africa at the moment as well. I think it's really, really key that to, to drive home that the mining sector certainly isn't dead in the UK and uh, there's lots of potential out there. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much, James. That was that was an excellent overview of everything. Um, it's really interesting to see how all the sort of certainly all the different systems come together and you sort of just put them all into one, one cohesive whole, which is excellent. Um, so does, does anyone have any questions for James about this? Just unmute and uh, Silence is good. <laughs> Silence is good. You've done a good job. <laughs> so, um, so how much, how much of this did you get taught, and how much of it did you learn on the job? Then, <laughs> so it, it's quite interesting. You know, 
at, at university, you know, went to mining school, you learn the principles, you know, you learn, learn your product management, you learn basic things about cost, budget. But personally, I found the biggest learning I had was being thrown in the deep end. When I uh, when I got to Woodsmith, I think on my I started actually as a, as a shaft technician, so it was a bit more hands on, a bit more interfacing, understanding the scope, and then went through to project engineering about four months in. And the first thing I, I was given essentially was a cranes. Quite little packing really phased me too much, but got that understanding right is how to do with procurement, the vendor interface, et cetera, et cetera. About one month engineering, I was thrown a muck handling system. So two well, four convexes for both shafts at the time, four conveyors, two dewashing screens, all the steel. And that's really where it was a case of baptism of fire, sink or, you know, sink or swim. So a lot of it you pick up through that. I'm a big believer in, in flow charts. So the team I have here now, um, what I did when I started here was, right, this is the process of project engineering. You know, essentially your, your check sheet, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? And the change management flow. I, I, I certainly believe project engineering can be taught to most people, um, but you just have to have that intuition, have that eye for detail essentially. Um, and also work towards that. It's not the kind of position I find that if you sit back and wait for it to turn out okay, it won't. Mm. It's always a responsive of, well, not always. We're trying to be proactive at the moment. <laughs> but it certainly is a lot of the issues you have, certainly from the construction side, is all active. So it's all about what I found is it's, it's mostly on the job learning. Mm. Excellent. And uh... Of course, there's all the talk about Camborne and uh, sort of the, the B, the uh, B eng in mine engineering. Um, for any sort of eight level students looking at going into this, uh, you, have you got any any advice on um, why why mine engineering rather than geology or straight engineering? So I think mining is just quite an exciting sector in general. You know, not only do you have your surface works, your open pit. Your quarrying lots of the sharp side of things um you know for me yes i, I love the mining sector at the moment we're constructing you know, what i did was before i did now we're building mines so winder installations you know our hoisting systems the head frame so it, it's really quite varied but within a, a relatively small sector i think the other one as well is just you get to travel the world see different cultures different experiences here in canada it's very different to the uk as it's very different to to africa so I think you get a full appreciation of lots of different scope. It's quite exciting. Generally quite large engineering, quite high risk, but also high reward. And for me, certainly the sector is very exciting. And I think you only have to get a picture and some stats of, you know, a 2000 meter shaft and your hoisting capacities and that'll capture most, uh, most engineers' imagination. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always fun when you go down. Uh, I, think, I think I've only gone down. 1,600 meters, and it's always that bit at the end where suddenly it's sort of it has to stop and let the cables flex slightly. <laughs> He's <laughs> bouncing, going. Well, I, I hope the winch is, uh, has done a good job of this. So, yeah, it's it, it's fantastic, fantastic to sort of go wandering around these things and see see what's going on. Um, I suppose the only other thing that comes to mind is it, it's is it pretty straightforward to transition into this kind of engineering from other uh, other disciplines or? So I think, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, there's a few different avenues. You certainly have the different side of your, your production engineering, your project engineering, then more your, your theoretical like mining engineering as well. And there's certainly different work streams. Uh, I'd say project engineering is you're setting up the project managers of the future. So it's not for everyone. Uh, like I said, you, you are dealing with cradle to grave type arrangements. So you deal with the procurement, you deal with the construction and the engineering. So well, certainly now we're working the EPCM framework, so engineering, procurement, construction, and you oversee all of that. Mm. So it's quite interesting. You, you essentially get a large scope and you get to master lots of different aspects. You don't necessarily focus on just one, one discipline, but opportunity is there. And ultimately, I think in management, it's, it's really key to have that understanding. So not only are you mechanical, but you do understand, oh, well, our PLCs for our, our instrumentation ties in like this, you know, mechanically it ties in like this, uh, mining, you know, it ties in like this. I think it's key to, to have that understanding. 
especially the, the interface that I, I certainly have had where I, I can actually work and, and be on the ground and be with people, you gain that understanding. So, you know, in, in, in 10 years time when I'm a manager and somebody says, oh, I can't do this because this is done, I can say, well, actually, you know, 10 years ago, I worked on that and I know that that isn't the case and we get around it this way. In terms of transitioning into it, I think if, if, as long as somebody has that drive and that interest in, you know, that management style, I think it's a, a brilliant job role. At the same time, uh, you have the ability to dash across, you know, production engineering or even design interface. It really depends on what people want. Mm -hmm. I'd say for anyone who is is interested, certainly in their early stages, you know, we have EITs here, so engineers in training, uh, the equivalent of a junior engineer. I think it's a really good basis to understand the full scope of a project, of a mine, um, and gives a good basis of, of understanding before going into higher managerial roles. Brilliant. Uh, David, do you have a question? Yes, I was just wondering, kind of, we've had a previous presentation on this mine, and one of the things that was raised then was the fact that because it's in a national park, they weren't allowed to have a traditional headgear. It had to be sort of sunk into the ground. Uh, kind of what sort of differences is this made kind of uh, to the operation of the headgear? So from, from, a, from a construction, from my, my involvement with that, I think the main difficulty with that was the construction. So like I said, with the install of the SBR, with the multi-phase lifts, everything had to be lifted into the shaft and then built bottom up, which is especially hard when you're battling winter conditions. So not only were we working to install the headgear, but also install the collar house as well. So I remember a lot of, a lot of meetings with the construction superintendents, just going through phasing how, you know, how I was going to bring items to them and how I thought it was going to work and then how they actually wanted to also work themselves. So it's always that considerations, it's always the logistics, and that's mainly through the lifting. That's what made it extremely, extremely different, I would say. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> Last chance for any questions. Otherwise, I think we'll sort of start drawing things to a close in that case. Um. <laughs> like I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I've, I've left my contact details. If anyone does want to reach out and uh, have any more questions or ask me about what my development looked like and anything like that, you know, more than happy for, for people to reach out and uh, can, can discuss that. Superb. Well, well, in that case, um, oh, hold on. Just a comment from Alistair Lynn there. Many thanks for your comprehensive presentation on a very impressive project. And then Andrew Leary, great presentation, James. Brilliant. Um, well, th thank you very much again, James. Uh, I think that was, was an excellent overview. It's always nice to see uh, British standard numbers being quoted by heart as well, uh, which is a... <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and uh, yes, well, we, we look hope, hopefully look forward to seeing you at the Institute in Newcastle at some point as well uh, when, you're, when you're back in the country. Um, so yes, with that, I think we'll draw things to a close. And thank you very much again, James. And thanks to everyone who attended.